Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Zara Ingelizian. I'm the head of consumer industries and the future of consumption platform at the World Economic Forum. I would like to provide you with a brief context about the future of consumption platform and why we are hosting a session on resetting consumption for a sustainable future. It is the mission of our platform to advance responsible consumption for the benefit of business and society. To realize this mission, one of our key goals is to accelerate environmentally sustainable consumption. Why is this critical? At current consumption level, almost three planets would be required to sustain a population that is poised to reach 9.6 billion people in 2050. We also know that consumers, especially younger consumers, are becoming more aware of the issues associated with the health of our planet. Increasingly, they are seeking products that are produced and consumed sustainably. The key question is, how do we meet consumer demand and transition the consumer value chain to a state that is more responsible? By illuminating a fresh set of solutions and perspectives today, we are inviting key stakeholders to join forces through collaborative ecosystems to address the challenges that lie ahead. We are fortunate to have Tim Davey, the Director General of the BBC, to moderate an esteemed panel. After 30 minutes, the live stream will end and we will transition to a deeper dive regarding the topic of sustainable consumption between the panelists and forum partners. Let's get started. Tim, over to you. Thank you, Zara, and thank you for the introduction. And welcome, everybody. I appreciate everyone joining um, this session. I think that in some ways, um, topics like positive transformation, sustainability, responsible consumerism, are all now topics that are so at the mainstream and so much of a given. The debate now moves into, for all of us as leaders, the how, not the what. And today, I think, is a really interesting chance for us to dis discuss that in the context of two industries, actually, I know well, having worked both at Procter & Gamble mm -hmm. and in the drinks business with PepsiCo, when you've got businesses that are well established, sustained actually brilliantly since the 1800s, but now facing these enormous times of change. And we've got an incredible panel to talk through for the next 30 minutes. And I'll be talking to them to understand this whole topic of how do we truly get to a consumption that is a pattern which is sustainable and responsibly managed. So we've got David Taylor and we've got a real global panel, I should say, David Taylor um, joining us from Cincinnati. David is chairman of the board, president and CEO of Procter & Gamble. Welcome, David. We've got Tak Ninami, who is joining us from Tokyo. Welcome, Tak. Good to see you. And you are president and CEO of Suntory Holdings. And then Jennifer Morris, a world expert as CEO of the Nature Conservancy and joining us from Washington, D.C. So welcome to all of you. It's fantastic to everyone, have everyone linked up from various corners of the globe. Let me start and we're going to have an open discussion on these topics before we um, go to the uh, closed session on Q&A. But let me just start, Jennifer, with you. And I said at the beginning in, in my um, words, this is now a question of how and getting on with it. What's your take in terms of this whole area of consumerism and how much we're using as a planet and the readiness of established businesses to transform their models? Great. Yeah, thanks so much, Tim, and thanks. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. It's great to be here with this incredible panel. So you're absolutely right. I mean, look, the pandemic has been an accelerator for so many things in our lives, right? Um, now we need it to really accelerate the transformation to more sustainable production and consumption because the first time, really, I think, in, and certainly in our generation, um, we're actually recognizing the connections between human health 
and planetary health in really profound ways. And so I'm excited to, to talk about the ways that companies, governments, consumers can really lead on this very important topic of sustainable conduct, uh, consumption. Look, as society rebuilds, there is a real sense of renewed opportunities for companies and governments to put investments and consumptions through a carbon neutral and biodiversity lens. And at the Nature Conservancy, that's what we're focused on. We're focused on ensuring that healthy oceans, freshwater, and lands tackle the climate emergency and that we protect the most important lands um, and, and ocean systems and freshwater on which all life depends. And responsible production and consumption is absolutely critical to this work. Food systems, in particular, are critical for this. We're using, as Zara said in her intro, we're using so much of our planet up that we're not going to have anything left for our children. So right now, we're seeing a real convergence of agriculture and environment for the first time not being seen as a zero-sum game, but really being able to connect the two in very profound ways. We actually know now that it doesn't have to be that we produce food that depletes the planet. We know now that it is possible to shift our food system in an effort to actually restore store nature instead of just depleting it. And it's not just about environmental NGOs saying this. Consumers are saying this. Companies are saying this. Uh, the Nature Conservancy just did a recent survey with Edelman Consulting to actually survey consumers and companies, beverage companies, all sorts of consumer goods companies. And the majority response was that it's not just about doing no harm that people, businesses, and consumers want to see sustainability that actually requires doing good for the planet, not just doing no harm. So it's not just about CSR or ESG. Mm. As you said, Tim, in your intro, the companies in the long term that will succeed are those that make this about DNA. And that's really what the Nature Conservancy is excited about, working with these companies who recognize this and then are willing to do the hard work to make it happen on the ground. And I just want to celebrate the companies here, Procter & Gamble, Suntory, Walmart, um, so many, Syngenta, so many companies that are attending this today. They have taken the first bold step, step to set targets. And now the hard work comes in to actually work on the ground, working with governments to provide the right incentives, both financial and policy incentives that will require that change to happen. And that's what I look forward to discussing today. Thanks, Thanks. Jennifer. Great. And that, and, and coming to David, I think, you know, the, Jennifer mentioned the, if you like, a new DNA. It's, it's easy when you're in, easier when you're, when you're, when you're forming a new company, but when you've got something of the success and that, DNA of a Procter & Gamble. Talk to me a little bit about, David, the scale of change. I mean, you've talked about const constructive disruption, which is, I like the term, is, is, is how, how much change you need to drive the, through the business to get this done. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. And, and Tim, I, I absolutely agree. We have to constructively disrupt almost everything we do. And, and those words are important. Because disruption can destroy. What we find, what we need is a way to constructively create a new reality. Because you're right, we have to change the way we consume many of the products, frankly, that we make and many other companies make. There's lots of disruption and it's accelerating. But in areas of sustainability, it means that we're looking to constructively disrupt everything we do. We start with our operations. We made a commitment to advance a portfolio of natural climate solutions that will generate a carbon benefit equal the cumulative emissions through 2030. This will effectively make our manufacturing operations carbon neutral for the decade and deliver an estimated carbon benefit of 30 million tons. But it's more than that. We have to work with whether it's you know, wonderful firms like the Nature Conservancy or Conservation International or World Wildlife Fund or many others or other companies to advance a number of projects that protect, improve, and restore critical landscapes around the world. And we know we have to do more than that. We have to make products in a way that consume less energy, that have less waste, that consume less water. And we can do that. We can use our scientific capability to change the way we formulate our products. And it even goes to how consumers consume the products. If we even change our supply chain and our manufacturing operations, that's not enough. We have to help work with consumers that ultimately use our products to consume them in a way that has lower impact. And one of the best examples is when you wash dishes. 80% of a washing machine's energy consumption comes from heating the water. 
We can design formulas that can take the water temperature way down. We can save the vast majority. And we're even working on a technology that eliminates water completely, reducing the need for plastic bottles, millions of gallons of water required to make, pack, and ship. All of these are examples where we're looking across our entire business model to constructively disrupt the way we do to help really reset consumption. Thank you, David. And I want to move to Tack and just like with the same question, really, which is what what we're hearing is across the board, which is this idea that this is a wholesale change of how we do business across all fronts, as opposed to the kind of CSR or bits on the side of the business. It really becomes something fundamental to survival and re-engineering all of what we do and how we work. Tack, uh, from from a Perspective from Tokyo here. What, what, what's your sense of the scale of change you've got to undertake as an organization? Great to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, first of all, we've been uh, working on the uh, sustainability things as well as the giving back to society almost for 122 years since we have found it. And we know growing for good means a lot. And that is educated to every employee, spend a lot of resources. So that means uh, our people know how important um, giving back to society means. That gives a trust from society. That gives us a license to, uh, to operate. But key thing is uh, how to uh, take our know-how to those uh, countries in in carrying lots of issues like uh, ASEAN countries, for example, those who need their resources. So from Tokyo, we have lots of businesses with the Asian countries, including China. David knows that quite a lot. You know, there are so many issues. So should we be only staying in a country where we have lots of, you know, solutions? How to take those solutions to other countries to solve problems? So that's the issue we are talking about now. Okay. Very that good. is a huge, and, huge I'm, change. You mean a it's cultural a huge change. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let, let me pick up with you guys a few of the kind of specific issues, and I'll, 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 I'll kind of touch on, on different things. But firstly, David, one of the obvious things, and I remember from my days in is the whole packaging question and, and, and just how far we can go to, we've looked at recyclability, more sustainable production. I mean, again, I'm really interested for this audience to hear the scale of changes you are feeling you need to make to make the business sustainable in this way. Talk to me a bit about packaging and how far we need to go. Well, I think one we need to dramatically change what happens today. If you just take plastic as an example, and you mentioned it, 70% of plastic is, is captured, but only 10 to 15% is recycled. In a world like that, and with the number of bottles and, and other plastic items being produced, we have to change it. But I think solutions can come. And one of the most exciting ones that I see, in addition to what we're doing as a company, and we, like many companies, have committed to having 100% of our packaging recyclable, reusable. We're reducing the amount of virgin petroleum plastic we use by 50% over the next decade. But we need to do more than that, much more. And we're part of a coalition of over 50 companies that have come together across the entire value chain. And it's part of the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. We've all voluntarily agreed to put up a billion and a half dollars over the next five years in order to develop sustainable models. And the key right now we need is sustainable, scalable, circular solutions. And to do that, we've got everything from the people that make plastic, the people that make plastic packaging. We're working with the plastic recyclers and others to develop pilot programs that can capture it, process it, and turn it into a second life, because the issue is the waste. We want nothing going into oceans, nothing going into the environment. Capture it, reuse it in a way. Where we can, we eliminate plastic and find better solutions. It may be paper solutions or others. Mm. But where we need plastic and it's the best alternative, let's develop these scalable, circular solutions. And to me, I'm excited about the fact that we now have pilot programs going in Jimbrana, Indonesia, where we're, you pay people to collect it, process it, and give it a second life. Because the issue, many companies are making very bold claims on using post-consumer use resin. The issue is there's not enough of it available today. 
So we've got to find ways to capture it, process it, and reuse it, in addition to working to eliminate it everywhere we can. Okay, fascinating. And, and that, 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 what you were saying about targets was really interesting as well. I, th I think, Tack, I wouldn't mind just, uh, you know, the other, the other resource as packaging that, you know, water in your, in your business, huge in terms of uh, the, another sustainability question uh, globally. Tell, talk to me a little bit about that as well, in terms of a lot of these businesses using a lot of, I mean, we talked about it earlier in terms of dishwashing and washing machines and water in that regard. But in your production, I mean, talk to me about that a little bit in terms of sustainability of supply. Is that something that's occupying your mind? Sure. Um, as a beverage company um, that relies on the blessing of natural water, we Santori is uh, committed to ensuring that natural water is passing, passed on to the next generation to come. To achieve that, we need to take a system-wide approach. As a company, um, our aim is to achieve net positive uh, uh, water usage by 2050. Yeah, we are also engaged in the broad activities um, that go beyond our organization to drive water conservation. For example, we partner uh, with local communities and the universities to nurture healthy forests with the uh, vast uh, uh, biodiversity, uh, very rich, that can generate abundant uh, groundwater, for, focusing on the areas uh, where we have operation. In Japan, we have already reached out the goal to cultivate the double the amount uh, to, to, of the uh, uh, water we use in production. Our efforts have expanded uh, beyond Japan to, to the United States and Europe, and we are now planning to go to the ASEAN countries as well. And another uniqueness uh, I want to talk about is uh, for, I mean, education for children. We are sending uh, instructors to teach uh, our children about uh, how blessing the natural water is, as well as uh, the, how natural water is uh, generated for many years, going through many soils. And then they will teach adults the, the importance of natural water. So we are sending instructors to not only Japan, but also Vietnam, Thailand, ASEAN countries. Because that kind of, you know, children will be, right. become ambassadors in the future. So this is a unique approach, but it uh, takes a lot of time, but uh, they will be uh, playing key role to the world. And as well as right. the, uh, they will work on the ocean litter things as well. Tim, one of the additional ways in water is to think about what's going on. Both our companies use a lot of water, but there's an exciting multi-stakeholder project called the 50-liter home that is a good example. Many of the folks probably on this call are involved in this project because there's many mm -hmm. companies that are working as well as WEF and many others. And the idea is in, in the developed world, we on average use 500 liters a day of water. What if we could still have the same quality of life at 50 liters, take 90% out, but still keep use the products you love? What would we need to do in terms of designing products differently, capture water you use from any one task, clarify it, come back? What do we need to use from an appliance standpoint? Think about if we could design it. And this is an example of the kind of things that multi-stakeholders working with outstanding NGOs, with companies, and in some cases with governments, can develop solutions because if we can do that we don't sacrifice right. quality of life but we do develop sustainable circular solutions right i think that's fascinating and also you're working with competitors as well which is an, an <laughs> industry group which, which is which, yeah. which is a different muscle to flex as well and jennifer i want to move to you because it's really interesting listening to i mean to you know very senior ceos here and if you look at that listen to the level of detail they have on this this doesn't sound like CSR anymore. This sounds like exactly. listening to this conversation. This is the meaning of life, the level of targets, the level of detail. And I'm not trying to say everything's great, perfect, but I tell you one thing, this is a different conversation to even a year ago, two years ago, in terms of what it means to be a CEO of a consumer goods company. What's your sense of how people are doing generally, the whole value chain, decarbonizing, the whole operation, 
how we, I, I, it's a bit getting back to the question at the top, but where do you think the areas that we need to push the corporate world a bit harder on and, and, and where you'd like to see more progress? Yeah, great. Thanks for that question, Tim. So first of all, agree that the, the efforts that have been made on plastic waste and water are phenomenal. We've still got a long way to go, but this sort of systems approach, recognizing that it's not just about your own company and your own uh, waste, it's about the consumer and how they're using their products as well as everything that's happening throughout a very complex supply chain. So that's to be plotted. Where I think that we need to do, quite frankly, a lot more work is around deforestation. And this is an area that's extremely difficult. There's been a lot of big targets that were made by companies um, uh, many years ago that unfortunately have not been achieved. Um, so if we could take that same approach, that systems approach that we're doing with waste and water and focus it in on deforestation, which has, of course, biodiversity benefits if we can eliminate it, but also, of course, has extreme climate benefits. 11% of global uh, emissions are coming from the destruction of forests, in particular tropical forests. If we could actually take that same approach, we would really be winning on both biodiversity and on climate change, and of course, helping so many people throughout the world. So it, it's really important, I think, that we think about the fact that there are some moves being made. The UK, the EU are getting ready to introduce legislation that will stop imported deforestation into those, those jurisdictions. That's terrific. But at the end of the day, it's going to take hard work by companies like the ones here, as well as NGOs, partners, communities, indigenous groups, et cetera, to really figure out how do we change the incentives? How do we flip the script on, from destruction and making money from forests that are torn down versus how do we ensure that we're bringing life back right. to land and restoring and bringing income back to those communities? That's where the hard work starts. And um, I applaud the efforts that have made so far, but we've still got a long way to go. That's really clear. And actually, by the way, I would add media companies like mine to the list because we saw with programming like Blue Planet, which is one of our big natural history landmarks, a noticeable change in attitudes to plastics. Uh, we, yes. yeah, I think there's a role in communication of these things that's very profound. I'm, I'm going to ask just um, Tack and David on one question around. I want to probe a little bit more of this working together across the industry. And then, then uh, as ever, it's unfair to do all this topic in half an hour because we could be here some time. But then, then, we'll, then we'll begin to wrap up in some of the key takeouts but it's fascinating to hear you all. why don't we start tack in terms of working with i remember in my days of pepsico i i, I remember who the enemy were um how's it work do you feel these are industry solutions or are they sources of company competitive advantage how, how's the balance there going to work uh, that's a great question because uh, this is a to be honest a strategic move as well not the csr Having said that, uh, but it's not uh, our turf for competition, as a matter of fact. And plus, affordability for consumers is very important. Cost matters eventually, because not every consumer is a green consumer. So definitely to achieve a certain level of economy scale, definitely we have to work together with the uh, you know, industry partners as well as across the industry, taking hands with the other competitors even, so that we achieve the goal. Because... You know, we want to keep the licenses operated together in this turf, definitely. But we work Very with helpful. the uh, Coke in Japan, for example. Right. See, this is the new age. That's good. Uh, David, <laughs> I mean, you mentioned it a little bit, but clearly th this, th this point you mentioned on scale as well is so critical, isn't it? And that can be sometimes only achieved, even however big the company is, by working across the boundaries. Um, it, how active in, is that in your sector and how well is that working? I, I, it's very active and, and it's working well. And it, we recognize in certain areas, and, and good examples are the area of equality and the area of sustainability. We will not get solutions unless we work across the entire, not only the business community, but working with outstanding NGOs as well. These multi stakeholders, the systems approach, as Jennifer says, I think is absolutely right. Uh, an example in the industry is the Consumer Goods Forum, which has hundreds of consumer products companies around the world are working together and have very active work going on in forestry, in water, in plastics, in many of these areas, food safety, many other areas. Because if we don't restore trust back for consumers, it's damaging for all. And we've recognized consumers rightfully care more and more about the environment. 
They want sustainable solutions. They care about the way the world is going to be for their kids and their grandkids. And they expect companies to step up and invest in solutions. And this is one where this problem is, this challenge is bigger than all of us, but collectively we do believe we can address it, which is why we work with partners mm. across, whether it's the Alliance Team Plastic Waste, and it's the value chain of plastics, or whether it, or whether it's the, the Consumer Goods Forum, or whether it's the World Economic Forum. These are multi-stakeholder reforms, which to me are the solution. And we all need to put our resources, our funds, our, our techno technological capabilities, as well as leadership in this, if we're going to address it. Yeah. Very good. And that's, uh, Jennifer, do, why don't you just respond? It's, it's interesting, yeah. isn't it? I mean, uh, to, to think about this in terms of just the scale of change required. I'm interested from your point of view, as you help industry, you, you, you're in your own role as well. What do you think are the key barriers here? Because, you know, too many of these sessions are just looking at the problems. I, I find this session actually quite <laughs> motivating to hear the scale of change going on in some of the companies. But what, 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 are the what are the real challenges here that you're seeing to make, make this happen at the speed it needs to? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I was just sitting here listening and going, you know, this is such, as you said, Tim, this is such a different um, approach where we have Pepsi and Coke and Centauri and competitors actually sitting down together to solve some of our biggest institutional and global challenges. That's amazing. However, um, I will say that I think those are often the companies that are already doing the right things that are sitting down together, right? So, which is amazing. Um, however, I think we need to really make sure that that policy drives the laggards to change as well. Because at the end of the day, we'll just have a lot of great examples of volunteerism of those companies who get it. Um, but if we don't have real policy changes that incentivize and de incentivize good behavior and de-incentivize bad behavior and reduce harmful subsidies for things that we know are not good for the planet and for people, that then we're never going to have real systemic change. So that's where I feel like the gaps are that we now need to drive, continue with this amazing collective action by, by the best companies, but then drive change across the sectors through policy and financial incentives. Great. Very clear. And, and that's, a, that's an intriguing other session, actually, in terms of where, 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 where regulation stops and starts. Look, we've only got three minutes left. So uh, and as I say, I could go for some time here. So I'm going to give you all a, a, a minute just to leave us with some thoughts in terms of for the, ne for the next few years, wh what is the really big priority in this area? Where, what, where do you want to leave your businesses in, 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 in three to five years' time in terms of this space? And just leave us with a thought. Um, Tak, do you want to just uh, cl close with something in terms of your vision for Suntory in this space? Uh, first of all, uh, we're talking about the partnership. Yes, partner. Q, technology. There are so many entrepreneurs in the Santori, Pepsi, Nidiva, big guys. We want to work with the uh, entrepreneurs with technology. Technology matters a lot. So, mm. you know, guys uh, from uh, Silicon Valley and lots of, you know, uh, places, they have an idea. We, sh we have to shake hands with them. Technology matters. Great. Thank you, Chad. David, any closing thoughts? Yeah, two things. One, it starts at home. We're responsible as a company to develop technologies and solutions that make a difference. We've got a great example, PureCycle, a technology that takes contaminated polypropylene and can turn it into a very high quality use that then has much greater value so it can be collected and processed. We're licensing that out so it can be scaled fast. On the other hand, in addition to doing our own work, as Jennifer said, we have to be part of the bigger solution, putting people and money, resources and money into these collective multi-stakeholder system solutions. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I've been involved in this Alliance 10 Plastic Waste. I'm now serving as the chair of that. And the Consumer Goods Forum, being part of organizations like that, working with the Nature Conservancy, Conservation mm -hmm. International, World Wildlife Fund, WEF, and many others, absent doing both, each company making a difference in their supply chain, their products, in the usage of their products, and being part of system solutions that address the broader problems, we won't address it. The good news is both of those are happening, and they're happening at a greater and greater scale, faster and faster, which gives me confidence that collectively we can address this. Thank you, David. Um, 
Jennifer, uh, your final reflections on the on the I think I think we've heard today a little bit, you know, of the scale of the reset. The, 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 it's a challenge for all of us, but it, it was fascinating to hear um, uh, what the panel said. What's your what's your final thoughts for us in terms of a challenge, I think? Well, I guess my my big challenge, first of all, would be that all the CEOs that are here need to talk to the political leaders. Um, to push this change so that you're not the only ones that are sticking your neck out on sustainability. If we could switch and we could flip the script on subsidies, right now $500 billion a year are spent on farming, forestry, and fishery subsidies that degrade the planet. If we could change even a percentage of that, and the, the, who are they going to listen to? They'll listen to us, but they're really going to listen to the CEOs. So if you guys could work more proactively with policymakers to create the incentives for change at scale so that the entire sector will change with you, that for me would be success. Thank you very much. You've given everyone their homework. So I, I enjoyed that. So uh, very good. I wanted to thank everyone for firstly attending the session, to Tack, David and Jennifer for sharing so openly some of the best practice. I found it really fascinating, the practicalities of this, which was uh, what I was hoping for.